Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to address motion M103, introduced by the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. This motion calls on this House to recognize the need to quell the increasing public claim climate of hate and fear and condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination. What are you talking about exactly? What qualifies as Islamophobia? Now, first of all, you've brought up that word, Islamophobia, and I know what that means, and I know why it was created, okay? Now, it's something that Andrew Cummins has said. This is a quote that is often inaccurately attributed to Christopher Hitchens. Islamophobia, a word created by fascists and used by cowards to manipulate morons. Islamophobia yeah. is alive and well. Just because you deny it doesn't mean it's not there, it doesn't mean it's not real. In conclusion, there is a fine line between freedom of speech and hate speech. We actually have a lot of pretty decent evidence as to where this word originated from. Well, the word Islamophobia is a term that was first coined in the early 1990s by a Muslim Brotherhood front group known as the International Institute of Islamic Thought. And it was uh, coined uh, in imitation, actually. It was inspired by the homosexual movement. They used terms like homophobia and homophobe. And it was simply uh, adopted as a means to stifle or censor any forms of criticism of Islam. And it really did not uh, become uh, very widely known until the post 9-11 era. To attack a person and their ethnicity, of course that's wrong. That applies to anyone. But to uh, critique an ideology, if it be Nazism for instance, that does not mean that you're expressing hatred. Okay, so with that bullshit word suitably debunked, we can get real now. <laughs> I just want to an answer. Will you leave? I'm, I'm a human being. I have rights. I, I don't understand. What did I do? Because I'm not creating a public safety issue. No Why would I be a public safety issue? Love? I can tell you. I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I have a lot of voices. No, I'm already here. God loves you, brothers and sisters. War with war is not the end. Sir, what, what, did what did I do? What did I do, sir? I want to know what I did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I need to know what I did. You, I'm, an, I'm a minister. Section 176 of the criminal criminal code says that you can't interrupt a minister while he's doing his. This is a free. I don't understand. I don't understand. The city of Toronto is refusing to grant a permit for a Christian music festival called the Voices of the Nations to use Young and Dundas Square. So. What's the reason the city has had a sudden change of heart after all these years and with no incidents? Well, let's listen to the City of Toronto's Natalie Bellman explain it here. Okay, well, I've already advised Peter that we're not going to be permitting you guys this year for next year um, because oh, wow. of the proselytizing on the square. And Go that's a big issue for us. Um, I know that in the past years we've had discussions with you, or at least my predecessor did. Oh, really? Um, had meetings with Peter with, with, with Peter with regards to the proselytizing and outlined very specifically what was allowed and what is not allowed on the square, and um, that was not adhered to this year. Oh, oh Natalie, sorry, just to clarify, where, did we prophetize this year at the event? Yes. We did? Um, yes. Your, well, your performers did. One of the performers did? Okay, in terms of yep. prophesizing, what do you mean? Like, do we mean like speaking, like, or just singing, or? Well, it doesn't matter if it's speaking or it's singing. Either way, if you're praising Jesus and praise the Lord and there's no God like Jehovah, that type of thing, that's proselytizing. So all of a sudden, the city is against proselytizing on city property. And you so Christian proselytizing or trying to convert someone to Christianity is problematic for the city. Well, that just sounds like anti-Christian bigotry to me, given that there's a Muslim kiosk giving out Qurans on the square. Then there's the Al Quds Day rally. If you don't know, Al Quds Day was declared by the late Iranian spiritual leader Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini as an international day of struggle against Israel. It's basically a march to end Israel with a bunch of violent anti-Semitism rhetoric. Al Quds Day marchers last year called for the death of Jews. Listen. We have to give them an ultimatum. You have to leave Jerusalem. We say get out or you're dead. But guess what? 
Al Qudsday had their permit renewed in 2014. And they got a police escort for their march in 2015. So what's my point? There's an anti-Christian bias in the public bureaucracy, and it's not just in Toronto. In Edmonton, the University of Alberta's pro-life group wasn't afforded the same free speech rights on campus as other groups. In Nanaimo, the city council tried to ban Christian groups from using the city-owned conference center. And in Young and Dundas, Reverend David Lynn was charged with busking for singing about Jesus. Toronto says no proselytizing, but what they really mean is no free speech for Christians. We all know that. I am a Christian. Demand a zero tolerance policy. Zero tolerance to be put in place is because, you know, you can hit somebody and that pain will go away and you'll forget it over time, but the emotional scars, they are traumatic. Not enough for one person to tell me you're not physically assaulted, so we can't do anything about it. That's not enough. And a few days after I sent in the mail, the email, um, I got a few calls uh, from the chief of police officers that mentioned earlier. And uh, the lady that I spoke with, the officer, she wanted me to join a Muslim consultative committee that comes under the jurisdiction of the chief of police's office. And I was invited to meet with one of the staff surgeons and two of the community neighborhood policing units. Everybody, by staying listening to it, you're helping him get his message. Is there, is there something you ignore him? Like all this is against my rights. I, why are you going against my rights telling people to leave? You're a police officer and you're you're taking sides. Do I have rights? I'm not taking sides. People are listening to me. Why are you telling them to leave what I'm saying? Because you're causing a disturbance. You're ca this is all on tape. You, no, I'm not causing a disturbance. I'm telling my religion. Is there something wrong with that? These women are called Nakabis, Muslims who cover their faces with what may well be the most controversial piece of cloth on earth. I really don't feel that we're oppressed in any way. And thankfully living in Canada, you know, we have the freedom of choice. And this is you were raised in Saudi Arabia, which has got to be one of the most Sharia compliant countries in the world, next to Afghanistan and the Islamic State and maybe Iran now. Um, and now you're an apostate of Islam and you've come to Canada. So what I want to ask you is about the Islamic view of apostasy or how Islam views people who've left the religion. And more importantly, how is Islamic apostasy rules and laws being taught right here in Canada in Canadian mosques and by Canadian imams? Okay. There is a Canadian imam wants to see me executed even though I escaped Sharia law and I came to Canada to live my freedom. The greater Toronto area, home to more Muslims than any other place on the continent. If you've constantly been, you know, uh, sort of taught a certain narrative within Islam that if you don't cover up, uh, you know, you're going to hell or you're, you're, you're not really a good Muslim woman or you're, you know, you're violating, violating some tenet of Islam. You know, with that hellfire and brimstone theology, there's no, no, no genuine choice. The growing presence of the niqab in the GTA, Hazan says, is a sign of increasing Islamic conservatism here. She says while most Muslims won't go off to join ISIS, many secretly sympathize. There is a significant segment of, of Canadian Muslims who feel a lot of anger towards the West, but they won't necessarily take up arms or they won't uh, necessarily go, go and, uh, you know, join, join a jihad abroad. Uh, but, but there is that sentiment, you know, there is that sentiment that there is somehow a war between uh, the West uh, and Islam. Like I was, I just didn't feel like I finally made a progress to like be on the team and then like I just felt very upset about it. Upset over being sidelined because of her gender. I understand that you know free mixing is something that generally speaking we do not do. More, more, more so out of respect more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's got nothing to do with discrimination or anything like that. It's out of respect, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, that's how you show respect to women, by telling them to get the hell off the playing field. Yeah, right. City TV was too politically correct to push them back on that. I got a question, though. Uh, would this Islamic soccer team also object to other infidels or other things that are haram, considered dirty in Islam on the other side? So, for example, if there was a Jewish player on the other side, would they say, get that Jew out of there? If there was a gay player on the other team, would they say, get that gay out of there? And would the soccer league comply too, out of political correctness? If you've heard the name ISNA before, this Muslim school is called the ISNA Private Islamic School. If you've heard the name ISNA before, it's because it stands for Islamic Society of North America. And they used to have charitable status here in Canada until the Canada Revenue Agency stripped them of their tax status, accusing them of funneling money to Muslim terrorist groups overseas. Seriously. ISNA was accused of funding terrorists. I guess it's a baby step forward that all they're doing now is picking on schoolgirls in Ontario. Well, parents in Chatham, New Jersey are disturbed by what they say is a local school's inordinate emphasis on teaching the beliefs of Islam, while at the same time suppressing any expression of Christianity. Students in a Chatham Middle School social studies class were shown a cartoon video describing the five pillars of Islam, the religion's core practices. The video included such statements as, quote, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And it ends with a non-Muslim accompanying a Muslim friend to a mosque to pray. I also feel that um, if you're, if you're going to teach it to that degree, you're teaching, you're teaching the tenets or the doctrines of a religion. So our question was, okay, then if you're going to do that in the public school, would you also be comfortable um, teaching the doctrines of Christianity, for example, well, sure. yeah. uh, to say, would, would you be comfortable in a public school to say, uh, I, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to him, but, comes to God but through me. And right. I don't know that the school would say that. Why is it that the Muslim community is not blending in with the rest of American society? because this is what they are being told in mosques across the United States, Dennis. And part of what they're teaching them in the mosque is do not assimilate with the Americans. They are your enemies. One of the things that bothered me is that as I traveled through one street after the next, and I'm talking about many streets, I did not see homes with an American flag waving outside. Is there any chance we have that Muslims will, will turn around and start to blend in? No, there is no chance. We are seeing a reverse, actually, instead of them blending in, instead of assimilation. If you were to take somebody, like an old neighbor who used to live in Dearborn, but moved away, and you were to drop them back into Dearborn, would they know where they were? Not really. 